Welcome. This is James Corbett of The Corbett Report with your eye-opener report for BoilingFrogsPost.com. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made headlines at the UN General Assembly last week for his theatrics in attempting to demonstrate the imminent danger of the alleged Iranian nuclear weapons program by drawing a literal red line on a childish depiction of a bomb more fitting for a wily e. Coyote cartoon than a serious political forum. Oddly missing from Netanyahu's speech was any acknowledgement that there is yet to be any positive evidence that Iran is pursuing a nuclear weapons program, any mention of the fact that the only nuclear power in the Middle East is in fact Israel, any indication that Iran is a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty while Israel is not, nor any admission that Netanyahu himself was a key member of a nuclear smuggling ring that smuggled nuclear weapons technology from the US to Israel in the 1970s, according to recently released FBI documents. Despite these omissions, Bibi achieved his goal. Headline after headline across the world fretted about the so-called red line, or the point at which the community of nations will commit to bombing Iran. Although this propaganda war of lowest common denominator props and stage tricks is depressing, what is even more frustrating is the fact that, contrary to what we are being told, Iran is in fact already under attack by Israel, the US, and other Western powers, and has been for some time. Through a series of measures, Iran has been facing an onslaught of cyber warfare, special operations, targeted assassinations, and crippling economic sanctions for years now. Probably the most obvious part of this campaign has been the series of bombings and assassinations that have claimed the lives of four of Iran's top nuclear scientists. Three of the attacks involved motorcyclists pulling alongside the vehicles of the scientists and attaching a magnetic explosive to the car, which subsequently detonated. One of the intended targets, Dr. Feridun Abbasi Devani, a nuclear scientist at Shahid Beheshti University, was able to survive when he threw himself from his moving vehicle before the bomb exploded. Another attack saw a respected nuclear expert, Maksud Ali Mohammadi, killed when a remote control bomb was detonated in his car. Yet another Iranian scientist, Dairush Razai Najad, was shot down in an attack in Tehran, in which armed gunmen on motorcycles opened fire on him outside of his house. In July of this year, a book by Israeli-American journalists Yossi Melman and Dan Raviv, called Spies Against Armageddon, revealed that the attacks had been carried out by Mossad agents, as had been universally suspected. Later that month, Iran arrested 14 people in connection with the assassinations, airing their confessions on state TV, along with images of the military garrison outside Tel Aviv where they allegedly attained their assassination training. Iran has not made clear when or how the prisoners will be tried, but has reserved the right to pursue charges through international bodies. The families of some of the murdered scientists have filed lawsuits against the US, UK, and Israel for their alleged participation in the assassinations, but nothing has yet come of this lawsuit. Another spectacular event occurred in 2010, when the most technologically sophisticated computer worm ever discovered, Stuxnet, was exposed and dissected. In June last year, a computer virus called Stuxnet was discovered lurking in the databanks of power plants, traffic control systems, and factories around the world. 20 times more complex than any previous virus code, it had an array of capabilities. Among them, the ability to turn up the pressure inside nuclear reactors or switch off oil pipelines, and Stuxnet could tell the system operators everything was normal. Unlike most viruses, Stuxnet doesn't carry the usual forged security clearance that helps viruses burrow into systems. It actually had a real clearance, stolen from one of the most reputable computer technology companies in the world. It exploited security gaps that system creators are unaware of. These holes are known as zero days, and the most successful viruses exploit them. The details of a zero day can be sold on the black market for $100,000. Stuxnet took advantage of 20 zero days. But once it got into a system, it didn't always activate. Buried deep in the Stuxnet code was a specific target. Without that target, the virus remained dormant. What was it looking to shut down? The centrifuges that spin nuclear material at Iran's enrichment facilities. Stuxnet was a weapon the first to be made entirely out of code. Of all the warfare tactics being used against Iran, however, 
perhaps the most destructive are the ones that are targeting everyday civilians. The regime of economic sanctions that Iran is currently suffering under, long recognized as an act of war in itself, is beginning to have a devastating effect on the Iranian economy, threatening the lives of millions of Iranian men, women, and children who have nothing whatsoever to do with Iran's nuclear program. Economic sanctions, which are designed to cripple a nation's economy and directly affect its civilian population, have long been understood to be an act of overt warfare in themselves. As they affect the weakest and poorest members of the target nation the most, they can often have more deadly consequences than bombing campaigns and military maneuvers themselves, as in Iraq, where the strict economic sanctions placed on Saddam Hussein's government in the 1990s resulted in the deaths of over 500,000 Iraqi children. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. In Iran, the sanctions are once again having the most devastating effect on the poor merchants and manufacturers. The number of products available for sale in Iran is dwindling as Western goods manufactured with Western materials and purchased with dollars are becoming more and more difficult to obtain. This is causing genuine economic pain for shoe factories, cooking oil manufacturers, and countless other businesses that are forced to lay off employees because they are unable to continue operations. In the latest news, Iran's currency has reached an all-time low after taking a dramatic tumble last month. Just yesterday, the rial lost 17% of its value in one day. The government's efforts to ease the problems for importers by creating exchange centers to supply them with US dollars at special prices seems to have accelerated a flight out of the rial and further pushed down the currency's value. This in turn makes life even more difficult for the average Iranian, who is becoming increasingly isolated from the global supply chain that the modern economy is built on. When you put on sanctions on a country, it's an act of war, and that's what this is all about. The first thing you do when war breaks out between two countries is, is you put uh, sanctions on them. You, you blockade the country. So this is an act of war. What would we do if somebody blockaded and put sanctions on us and prevented the importation of any product in this country? We'd be furious, we'd declare war, we'd go to war. So we are the antagonists. We're over there poking our nose and poking our nose in other people's affair, just looking for the chance to start another war. First it's Syria, then Iran. We have too many wars. We need to stop the wars. We don't have the money to fight these wars any longer. One can only imagine what the situation would be like if the tables were turned. If there were bombing campaigns in the United States targeting American scientists, cyber weapons being launched in Tel Aviv against Israeli business interests, and economic sanctions being enforced by the non-aligned movement that was threatening to starve European children. The very suggestion implies its answer. There would be retaliatory strikes the very next day in the heart of Tehran, and any amount of civilian casualties would be justified as a response to this Iranian campaign of terror. But coming as it does from Washington and Tel Aviv, these outright acts of warfare are barely even reported on, let alone acknowledged as acts of war in the Western media. And as a result, the Iranian government finds itself in that most impossible of positions, allowing the Western powers to dictate Iran's policies and appoint its leaders, or facing ever more punishing economic and even military action. It's incumbent on those of us who understand this process of covert warfare for what it is, actual warfare, to bypass the bought and paid for media and to spread this understanding to others in time to create a significant anti-war movement or to face the inevitable consequence, the smoking rubble of yet another toppled civilization and the opening salvo of a third world war. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.